Hey guys, we are live. Welcome to the Bags to Riches podcast. I'm your host, Zach Ginn. And on today's episode, we are probably in the presence of one of the virtual wholesaling queens, one of the best virtual wholesalers and one of the best teachers of it, uh, Lauren Hardy. Lauren is with Wholesaling Inc. And she's here to share with you how you can virtually wholesale over five deals a month. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for coming on today, Lauren. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. So uh, let's get this out of the way. How did you get started in wholesaling and specifically virtually wholesaling? So, um, well, I got started um, in real estate investing in general uh, as a house flipper about eight and a half years ago. So a little bit about me. I'm from Orange County, California. So Southern California, very high price market right now. I think our average house price has hit about $800,000 here. So um, very, very competitive real estate market because you're really competing with people that just want to live here and have cash. So, um, being an investor and telling somebody you, you know, can make them a cash offer is no incentive to, um, have them give you 20 or 30% of their equity, um, just does not work here. So I started though, eight and a half years ago when there was still, we were in a recession. So it actually was a beautiful time to be a house flipper. Um, so that was when I got my start. Um, as the years went by, the real estate market heated up around here and it got harder and harder to get discounted deals that made any sense to flip. So I had to figure something out or I had to quit and just go back and get a job. I didn't want to do the latter. So I started networking with people out of state and I realized that a lot of my friends that I knew that were doing this business out of state were not dealing with the inventory issue that I had. So I realized I have to either make this work out of state or I have to go back and get a job and quit. So that's what I did. I went virtual. So that was about four, four and a half years ago. Um, I started going virtual. I went to Tennessee first. Um, and then I went to Oklahoma. Now we're in uh, about four different markets. So it's been a uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. people to flood them. Yeah, yeah. It's been a bit of an evolution. And we were just talking, we tried Port St. Lucie for a minute just to see what it was like. And um, we, I wouldn't say we gave up per se. We just had a hard time finding a JV partner to work with. So we need to talk more about that. Yeah. I mean, Port St. Lucie is crazy. It's a lot of older people, but I can go forever on it. I mean, we've, there's so many virtual wholesalers that struggle there and then some that do well, but um, yeah, your story is absolutely amazing. I, th I think it's really cool and it's really inspiring. So I really wanted to break it down, but what I really wanted to break down with you is you you have a virtual wholesaling business. There's a lot of other virtual wholesaling businesses out there, but really the reason why I liked your virtual wholesaling model is because I think you said once that you haven't talked to a seller in like two plus three years. I mean, that is something I think a lot of people find really attractive. So can you explain how you sort of delegate the virtual wholesaling? Because it's one thing to virtually wholesale yourself, but there's another thing delegating that task for your basically hands off. Well, I always went into this business knowing that I needed to scale because my primary goal was time freedom. I was willing to give away some of the profits of my company to not have to work very much. That was sort of my goal is to work less. <laughs> so um, I, I'm a mom of two kids. I'm a single mom. I've got two young children. So it was very important to me that I could be there for the important moments of their life. And I didn't want my phone ringing all the time with sellers calling me. And, um, you know, when you're working that acquisition role, talking to sellers, like you have to be able to jump on the phone right now to lock up the deal. Like there's a time, there's times where a seller will call two o'clock in the afternoon and they are ready to sign right now. And if you are not the one answering their call, they're going to pick up the phone and call another investor. And I knew that. So I knew going in, I was going to have to hire somebody to be that person for me. So um, I very early on started with just kind of replacing myself as quickly as I can in the different tasks of this business. So the first person that I did hire was someone that could just be available um, Monday through pretty much all week, actually. Uh, but Monday through Friday, primarily business hours that they could just be available and pick up the phone and talk to sellers and do that acquisition role. So that was the first person I hired out. Um, so yeah, that's why it has been a very long time since I've talked to sellers because it's always 
always that person. And I've just been really lucky that that person stayed with me. Wow. Um, and now he actually works dispositions. That's who you've met before. Okay. Um, he works disposition dispositions and he's been with me for six years. So I got lucky on that, you know, having somebody that's been, you know, loyal with me by my side the whole time as well. That's amazing. And it was this person, are they actually in the United States or are these VAs? No, he's local in California with me. Nice. Sweet. Yeah. So uh, basically, I mean, you've scaled up for a pretty good operation and uh, it, it's something that a lot of people like, but uh, really let's, let's bring it back to like a bigger picture here. So with your virtual wholesaling, what is your primary like marketing strategies for it? And most importantly, how, how much are you really spending uh, for a deal virtually wholesaling versus the average person doing the physical stuff? I don't really have, you know, exact numbers because I, I am only virtually wholesaling. <laughs> so I can't tell yeah. you, um, I don't have a model to compare it to, to say, um, and if you were in your local market, use this, I have to guess the same, honestly, the yeah. only extra expense that I spend and that anybody would, ex would spend, um, at first it would be a JV partner. So when I go into a virtual market that I don't have a buyer's list in, I, go into it trying to form you know some kind of partnership with that jv partner with a jv partner like i and it would be someone like yourself right so say i was like hey i want to go into port st lucie um you know would you want to partner up on some deals i'll do all the acquisitions i'm going to bring you this contract it'll already be signed you have to do the disposition side so show it to your buyers um let people in meet the seller take photos whatever you need to do to sell this house you know and we'll split it um, so at first it's going to cost you that split, right? You're going to have to share your deal. Um, but that's okay. You know, cause you're also doing half the work and you probably would have, if you were doing all of it, like you would have hired, had to have somebody on your team doing dispos dispositions as well, probably. Um, so, you know, I mean, I would say that might be, um, an upfront, uh, an upfront cost to ex ex like expect at first. Um, and then we have gotten to a point, um, in the markets that we are more like i would say that we've been in for a while um we have i call them runners which basically is an errand runner and i just coined this term a runner <laughs> so um, a runner is just literally somebody who just runs errands for your company so they do the showings like to the buyers um, they take the photos, the initial photos, they do like kind of the initial photo inspection and photo videos and send it to our disposition guy. Um, so we pay runners like 20 bucks an hour, honestly, like in, on one file, maybe it's under a hundred bucks in runner fees. And, but those are the deals that we have like a robust buyer space. So we don't need the JV partner. Um, I recommend everybody at first go to a JV partner in a new market because you don't know what you're doing. Like we talked a little bit before the show, like every market is so different it's very hard when you first go into a market like you might think you have a deal and the local jv partner is gonna be like no that street is like that one bad part of town you know oh, because yeah. whatever you know but how would we have known that we don't you know we don't live there um but on paper it looked like it was a good deal it looked like you know we had it at a good discount so um jv partners are really important at first um, you know, the, in the JV partner usually is stoked because it's good for five to 10 deals just falling on their lap that they get to move. Um, so I always recommend first go in it that way, being okay that you're going to give up some of your profit because what you're going to learn is worth it. It's going to cut your learning curve in that market. Um, and then organically kind of building your buyers list on the side, you know, find a runner, finding a runner is so easy. You can do it in like a day. Um, so yeah, that's, those are just some of the little extra expenses. Whereas if it was in your backyard, yeah, you wouldn't really need a JV partner unless you really wanted to bring one on. Um, you wouldn't need a runner. Um, but it's very negligible. If you think about it, if you've got the buyer's list already in, it's negligible. All right. And uh, I mean, the, the runner's big here, uh, obviously the JV stuff's great, but uh, really quickly, I mean, obviously you have your own course on Wholesaling Inc., so I don't want to give out the secret sauce, but uh, for someone watching this, where would you recommend they get started if they're trying to find a runner? Um, Craigslist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Craigslist is where we get a lot of them. Um, another great resource is just finding a local realtor. 
So there are a ton of realtors that, you know, they're kind of struggling. They're in between commissions and they would love a $20 an hour gig. So we've worked with a lot of realtors. And then sometimes that realtor ends up being like your own personal realtor. If you end up flipping houses there, like we've had those situations uh, where we end up picking up the property and flipping them ourselves and stuff. So realtors are another really good source. Great. And, uh, so the, the one question I do have for you, I don't think this has been asked because I did a couple of research, did some research before here, but, uh, you were doing Oklahoma city before it was trendy. I would say yeah. uh, so wholesaling. Yeah, and it absolutely. When you were doing it, it is absolute killer. No one talked about it. It was great. How did you find that type of market and how could somebody find the next quote unquote Oklahoma city for uh, virtual wholesaling? You know, the thing is, it's funny. Um, so I, I personally don't tell people publicly what markets I'm in anymore. Um, other than no, no, no. Other than Oklahoma, because the cat's out of the bag. But be, I, what and I've spoken to other educators who have podcasts, they have noticed the same trend that there's a certain like when you get on a certain podcast, and you're saying what market you're in, it attracts people to the go. Oh, well, she's in Oklahoma. That must be the virtual market. So I noticed that when I got on that platform with Wholesaling Inc., my response rates got cut in half like that, like so fast. So I do think that it, there was a little bit of like it attracted people to just try Oklahoma. Um, but honestly, there was a lot of people in Oklahoma when I first started to. It was, it was very popular. Um, there's no secret sauce. Like I wish if I could tell you that there is this secret, like to finding the perfect virtual market, I get this asked by every one of my students. And I said, if, if I knew that I would send all 150 of my students to those 10 markets in the United States, and then it wouldn't be anymore because then they'd be oversaturated. So there it's like, there's really no um, there's no way to figure out like, what's the great market. There are plenty of markets that are just as good as Oklahoma city, like plenty. I, they're all out there. Um, my number one tip though, there's through lots of trial and error. And I've tried, like, as I explained to you, we, we bump in and out of markets and we try to see if there's just like a synergy. And sometimes we're like, this is a sign from the gods that this market is just not really working out for us. For whatever reason, it's not, we're gonna pull out. Um, but then some markets we like jump in and we're like, oh my gosh, like this, we close the deal pretty quickly. I think this is a sign we should keep going. Um, one thing that I found, like the just the one, like if it at least, if you at the very least look for this, is the proof of the concept of what you're trying to do. Mm. So if you are trying to be a wholesaler who wholesales five deals a month, you need to be able to find like three people relatively easy that are wholesaling five deals a month in that market. Yeah. And if you can't, and there are, I'm telling you, there are markets that are like that. I feel like your market's one of them. Like it, it's, it, it's where it gets when you can't find that, you're going to have a hard time wholesaling virtually because a, you're not going to find a JV partner very well. Like you slim pickings on your JV partner. Um, B, there might be a reason why there's not a lot of wholesale activity. It, it could, and there's so many nuances to every market. I can go into like a bunch of different, you know, things I've found about different markets that like why people don't flip homes there or yeah. you know, whatever. So it could be, um, like my funniest story, I always tell everybody like the Tulsa, Oklahoma story. So everybody is like, people are in Tulsa now. Okay. Tulsa is like now has a wholesaler base. Yeah. But when I started in Tulsa two years ago, I could not find one wholesaler there. I thought like, this is weird because Tulsa is right next door to Oklahoma city. There's a buttload of people in Oklahoma city. Like why, why can't I find anybody in Tulsa? So I'm thinking, Oh, this is great. Like, no, nobody's going to be reaching out to the sellers. Like, this is awesome. Like, I'll be the only person doing direct to seller marketing because I have no competition. You think that, right? Yeah. Um, and Tulsa has the same population, same house prices. It, it looks exactly the same. Like, it's the same place as Oklahoma yeah. City. They're next door to each other. So, like, I go into Tulsa and I, I try trying to find a JV partner, trying to find somebody to partner up with deals at first. 
striking out left and right, cannot find anybody. And all I kept hearing is, yeah, you know, wholesalers kind of come and go. Like we, they, they, they try it and then they never, nobody's ever really been able to stick around very long here. And I'm like, that's so weird. Like why? Right. Well, then I realized something. So I tried it. I just said, fine, I'll just build a buyer list on my own. And I did all the methods to buy, to build a buyer's list. So we started getting deals and we would send them out to our buyers list. And the buyers were like, you're shady. What is this? What's wholesaling? Blah. Like, And I'm like, oh boy. Okay. So they're not even like looking at my ads, you know, like they're not looking at like taking me seriously. So I can't move properties because like nobody's taking me seriously. Um, it was even kind of difficult because you didn't have enough wholesaler activity to drive the prices down in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So it's always nice when you're like zooming in on comps and you can kind of find like a few that you bet wholesaler, us wholesaler picked up and sold to an investor. Everything went on the market there. So sellers were hard to negotiate with because they're like, everything was market price. We, I, I had a very hard time finding like the distress sale in every, every deal. So yeah. it was like, it was hard on both ends. And we thought, okay, well, let's go to like the RIA. Like, let's go to the, there was like no real estate investment association there. There was like one and it was not really collaborative. It wasn't really ran in a collaborative way. Mm. Um, so it was the funniest thing. I mean, now looking back, I wish I would have just avoided Tulsa and gone to like somewhere else, like where there was other wholesalers there. You need a little bit of competition. Like you need, cause you work, it's collaboration too. You guys help each other out. Oh, definitely. I, I mean, I, I think there's like three, seven figure wholesalers in a population of 200,000 here. So it's, it's definitely works. People do make it, but it's it sometimes it's just different markets are weird. I mean, are you still in Oklahoma city? Yeah. And so my next question here is something people have been talking about forever. I think Oklahoma bill four, seven, whatever, um, passed by the Republicans and the Democrats, they're like pass it to ban equitable interest without a licensing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it kind of got stalled out, but do you have any plans? Because it seems like Oklahoma is getting ready to kind of ban wholesaling without a license. Um, do you have any plans for any States or markets that are kind of getting that kind of regulatory, uh, more or less? Uh, state you know okay with everything um with any situation that you think might be negative and oh no like the sky's falling wholesaling is going to be illegal i'm gonna quit and start getting into cbd like i, I you know i like st calm down like it's there's you in our business like you have to be willing to change and adapt mm -hmm. You know, who moved your cheese, right? This is, that'll be the who moved my cheese moment in Oklahoma. If they make, if they do pass the bill, it did get stalled. And I think we are getting close. I do, I do probably think it's going to get passed this year. So I am personally optimistic. I'm actually very excited because in all of those, like I call them, I, the term I use is wholesaling is illegal states. So even though that's not true, like, but I just call it wholesaling as illegal states. So in all of those states, the reason it became, you know, that bill came, it was that there was enough wholesalers and newbie wholesalers or less sophisticated ones that were doing some shady stuff to make all of us look bad, flooded those markets. So now they had to create laws, you know, to kind of protect the, you know, the consumers against those people. Well, those people also competed against me and my marketing efforts. Yeah. You know, those people were, I mean, it was, it was junking up, you know, the business. My thinking is there's going to be a nice purge where you're not going to see as many of those people. Um, so I'm going to have less competition. Now I have the means I can raise private money. I can buy these homes, close on them myself if I have to and sell them that way. If I have to, I'll just get into hoteling, which I'm totally fine with doing, but there's a lot of people that in Oklahoma, like that I can think of, like, they won't want to do that, you know, and they'll probably just move into doing something else. Maybe they'll get their real estate license and become a realtor or I don't know, work in the CBD industry. I don't, I don't know. And, uh, so can you explain CBD for people that don't, <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. Oh, okay. <laughs> like okay. marijuana. Like, 
everybody, I feel like uh, it's, oh, yeah, it's okay. like people are getting into CBD. Like everybody's in CBD right now. And I feel like it's like the trendy thing. Like, yeah. you know, it's the next thing, you know, that people are jumping on. All right. And uh, my next question here is, uh, this is also live in the Wholesaling Houses for Real Facebook group. So we got thousands of people on there. Uh, we got a lot of people from Australia, Europe. I got some people from Trinidad and Tobago on here. Like wow. a lot of international people probably tuning in on this. They're pretty excited about this. Do you have any like students that are international? And do you have any tips for those people trying to do virtual wholesaling outside the country? Yeah, I do actually. Um, I've got one of my faves is Vincent in Spain. I've got a guy in India. I just talked to a guy. Um, he's active duty in one of the Middle Eastern countries. Can't remember which one he said. I have a lot of international students. Um, so yeah, they make it work. I mean, with cloud-based phone systems, you can do anything. I mean, you can make it look like you're from anywhere. You know, you just get a, a cloud-based phone system and you can, you know, pick your area code. Um, so they just work off the cloud-based phone systems. Um, but yeah, they, we've got a lot of internet. In fact, I have international VAs that talk to sellers. Oh, so my, my virtual, um, I have VAs that, um, are from Mexico and, you know, they talk to sellers and so it's very possible. All right, sweet. And then we got a, uh, who we got Warren Clark from Australia. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Um, oh, we got someone from Canada. Sweet. Um, so next question is, can you explain some of the systems that you're using for your virtual wholesaling business? I know I kind of got this question on my DMs. It was kind of weird, like last minute. But um, what are your systems basically from front to back? Like what are you using for texting, cold calling, management of the VA, stuff like that? Um, okay. Well, I use for texting. Um, I'm a big fan of the batch leads system. So batch leads.io. Yeah. Um, I love, you know, you had Annie, I guess on the show, um, love the guys there. Love Annie, good friend of mine. Um, I really am obsessed, obsessed. I know it's like, I have to just always drop this is I'm obsessed with the batch lead stacker. Like, I think that yeah. thing just changed my life. <laughs> I'm obsessed with it. So, um, I, I always have to like give them props on that tool. Um, but I use uh, the batch lead system for texting as well. Um, I use, this is actually funny. We've been changing up our phone systems today. Um, wow. If there was a way that we could put all the functionalities of call rail, mojo dialer, and call tools like all together, that would be the perfect system. If anyone can get on top of that, please like let me know and develop this system. Um, because the call systems all have like, what, like some softwares like have a few uh, things, right? And then like some are like have more, but missing the ones that the other one has. So um, the call system thing is tough. I use call rail to get my phone numbers. I buy all my phone numbers and I store them with call rail. Um, I like to think people go, why do you need call rail? And I'm like, well, first of all, I started eight years ago. So I was buying these things from call rail eight years ago. So I'd have to port all my numbers if I went anywhere. Um, I buy different phone numbers for different campaigns so I can, so I can use those phone numbers to, for campaign attribution. So if a lead call calls in, I know like they dialed this number, meaning that they were, they got a text message from us. And that's the caller ID number that came through. So they dialed it. I know they were a texting lead. So um, all my numbers come from call rail. Um, I use the batch system for the texting. We did used to use Mojo Dialer up until today. We are now using call tools. Mm -hmm. um, so that those are all the systems as far as our outbound sales um, that I can think of. Yeah, that's those are the ones that we're using right now. Okay. And was it a change from the three to 10 line that kind of got you on there? No. So Mojo, you can't dial out. Like you can't like say like a seller, just like, it doesn't work like a phone. It's just no. the predictive dialer. So we made a job change where our, I call them sales reps. A lot of people call these people acquisition managers. I personally use the term sales rep. Our sales rep has now some outbound lead generation responsibilities mm -hmm. because it has become harder to get leads. More people yeah. are in, into this. Uh, more people are use, utilizing texting and cold calling. Gone are the days where, you know, they were getting one lead an hour from 
cold calling and like three an hour from texting, like that doesn't happen anymore. When I had one person do both the texting and the cold calling at the same time, they were getting one lead an hour doing both of those efforts. I mean, it's gotten cut by, you know, in four. So I now have our sales reps have to cold call a little bit, half the text, but they also have to pick up the phone and call their lead, like in yeah. qualify them and call them back and follow up on the offer. So I was like setting them like mojo. And then they're on this other thing called just call for their soft phone. I was like, Oh no, this is like, this is, they can't have three different like areas where they have to pay attention, you know, too much, too much. So, um, so I have that, you know, that's why I went from to call tools because call tools actually you can dial out too. Okay. So that's beneficial. Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. so we got some interesting questions. So before I get into uh, some of the questions here, a uh, question I had for you is what does your system sort of look like overall? So how many people do you have for, uh, for your, I don't know, the, the sales type role and the yeah. and basically, uh, what does the whole system look like? So we've made a revamp this year and it was because of the lead flow issue. It mm -hmm. was, it really hit us about quarter four, quarter three a bit, quarter four, like election time, um, where we were, our leads, we were just having a very difficult time getting leads in um from cold calling from texting so that i had to turn up getting leads um so i made the decision to kind of combine that role like instead of just having one person that texts all day and calls all day um i've now made like the f acquisition team has to do that too like they have to get help with lead generation um i actually recently just hired a few more so like today, so that's why I was doing all the call tool stuff today. So we right now have a team of five, um, but that's very, very new. We used to have just two. Um, we hired three more because it's in guys, quick tip, like when you hire people, it's a very good chance that one or two are not going to work out. So I now only hire in bulk. I don't hire just like one person. I am like, or like some people take the idea of like always be hiring kind of like mm. just always be like having an always interview, always like look for talent. Some people do that. Um, I like personally took the opportunity to like just kind of look for three people knowing that maybe like one might quit or maybe even two. So I'd be really happy if the team just stayed at like four. But for right now, we have five Um cold calling and um, texting as their lead generation. They're doing some outbound sales. And then when they do get a lead, they do have to work the acquisition side. Um, so I've really kind of simplified acquisitions. Um, I make it a lot simpler than a, what my students, like my students try to complicate it. And then I like have to beat them over and say like, Stop, you're over complicating it, you know? Um, so they have a very like as simple as I can make it. Like I've made it simple for the acquisition team. So their focus is to get the seller to like them, you know, to really, you know, it's a P we always say we're people first. So just pay attention to the seller, make sure you're serving the seller and you're being helpful any way you can. And pricing, um, we have a spreadsheet that like we, that they use, but we have somebody that I call underwrites their deals, which is our disposition guy. So if they have a lead, that's actually like, cause it's like five people, right? That's a lot of sales reps. Like they're going to get a lot of leads, right? One person pricing them, that person be pricing all day long. So we have kind of guidelines, like, so they know they're, they're going to throw a price range out to the seller to kind of see if the seller's in these brackets, yeah. right? You know, like in their wide brackets, but you know, that's going to knock off 50% of your calls. Like we kind of figured out a percentage of this is estimates that it's like, if it's in between here, here, now they're kind of worth talking. If they're not, we need to put them in more of a follow-up category until they get in these brackets. And then when we get them in these brackets, now you can bother our disposition person and talk pricing with them. Okay. So, yeah. So that's kind of how it works. They're doing that side of it. They're pricing it out in a very loose way. Then they, if the seller's in this, we call it in range, 
you know, then they are going to ask the underwriting department, we call it like to underwrite the deal and give them like the offer and don't go any higher than this. And then it's just up to them to get the seller to agree and to sign um, our seller sign um, over, you know, or via DocuSign. Um, we don't see the property first. Um, so that's kind of where you get, and it's tough with virtual because then you, you know, sometimes you go see the property and the seller was lying or it's in a weird part of town. You didn't really realize, and that's to be expected with virtual. Um, we've just accepted that as like, that's part of the business. Um, so then from once it gets signed, it goes to our disposition, disposition team and they will schedule someone, a runner to go take photos and um, we do the marketing in house, we send it to our buyers, and hopefully we find, you know, we get multiple offers on the deal and we'll lock it up and go to escrow. Easy as that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my next question here is, I, I mean, you're part of Wholesaling Inc. And obviously there's new coaches coming in, but um, really from pr the previous coaches, there's, you know, guys that swear inbound marketing versus outbound marketing. Um, it seems like you're doing a lot of outbound marketing. Is there any reason you're not doing like a ton of direct mail for virtual wholesaling? I, because direct mail is very expensive. So I do some direct mail. I do. Hmm. I don't recommend it to students that are new because a lot of them have tight budgets and I've seen people go broke on direct mail. Okay. I've seen people get in debt with direct mail. Um, so I do some direct mail, but it's very like niche lists. Um, it's more of a thoughtful approach to direct mail marketing. I don't do a lot of it though. It's just, it's very expensive. But what I do feel, I feel like a lot of people are not doing direct mail right now, you know, compared to how they were like three years ago. So if you were to try direct mail, maybe now would be the time because more people are doing the cold calling and the texting. Uh, it's it's insane the amount of saturation. I mean, unfortunately people like you and me are just talking about how much we're making on wholesaling. It's uh, making things a little more difficult, but uh Let's get some questions from the audience here. So uh, guys, before we get into it, remember, smash that like button and subscribe and uh, go comment. And uh, we'd love to uh, answer your questions. So uh, first question here. Let's see, come back with it. What's up? Love Lauren's videos. Thanks. Lauren's Beast Lover podcast and whole <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Josh. Uh, all, right. all right. Thank so, you, Hawkins. Uh, all right. So let's see here. Um questioning wholesalers out here uh really let's see we got some oh my gosh okay so uh pretty important question right here is uh gary asks if the seller's elderly and cannot docusign how do you get around that uh fiscally or do you fiscally send the contract uh okay so for sure you know we get this all the time or sometimes we get sellers that are just like listen i agree on price but i want someone to come here to my house like that happens so we send a runner and our runner will literally print the contract out and, you know, hand it to them. Um, if you don't have a runner and you're like in a pinch, um, there's notaries. Like, I think, what's it called? It's a, like, there's some kind of notary. One, like, two, three, notary? is it one, two, three notary? I'm like, I'm thinking oh, that's, that's of what I mean. notary. Like <laughs> I've done it before where we've like, just throw it, like sent a mobile notary down. Okay, sweet. And then basically it's pretty easy. And then, is there any specific contracts that you use for virtual wholesaling? Like obviously Oklahoma is different than Georgia. Um, is there, do you have to change your contract for every state you do? You know, personally in the States that I'm in, no, but I do think that there's some States that require some disclosures. Yeah. I'm just not in them. So I wouldn't know. So I advise to everyone, make sure you review your contract that you plan to use with an attorney so that way, you know, you know, your contract is legal in the state you're working in. Sweet. And then uh, John Bates says, uh, what skip tracing service are you uh, currently using? Batch leads.io or batch skip tracing, same company. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're great. Sweet. And then let's see here. And then uh, S uh, Mincy asks, uh, basically, uh, where are you getting your lists? Uh, my list. Okay. Yeah. I didn't talk about that. Um, I love, I'm loving prop stream. Always liked prop stream and list source. I use, I've used list source from day one. Um, but now you're just getting such a better deal on prop stream yeah. for the data. So I'm using list source less and less. Um, 
But yeah, so definitely a prop stream. I mean, you you were here four years ago. I remember when I first started. They uh, the, the wholesaling ink list source pricing was it was, good. Ago, it was the most amazing thing ever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that uh, prop stream is pretty good. Um, yeah. Mark says here, uh, love the content. Did you find the conversion rates are higher if you have an agent locking up the deals for you? Mm, that's a good question. Depends. Mm. So certain market, okay. Everybody thinks like when they start getting this idea of having like agents list the contract on the MLS, if that's what I think that's what you're referring to is having agents list your contract on MLS. Mm. So a lot of people think like that's going to max the value. And what I have found in practice is it's not necessarily true in every market. So first of all, if you want to take on this strategy, you want to make sure it's legal. It's legal in your state. Their MLS allows it. Make sure the agent's asking their broker if it's okay, whatever. Um, but saying that all let's pretend everything is legal and okay and kosher in the state you're in um i've had an area where my buyers list is actually better than the mls because if the mls i have to pay the realtor fee where my buyers list i could have i could have sold it so um and not paid the realtor fee so i've had that but then i have other states or other areas uh <laughs> tulsa <laughs> like the, the, the tulsa example where listing my contracts on the MLS was my only option. Like, and that's how we started in Tulsa. And we've slowly like gotten away from having to do that, but it's still something we do from time to time. Definitely. I mean, the agents are, they're hit and miss sometimes, but uh, my question here is I get asked this question all the time and I'll flash a virtual wholesaling check all the time. And people still think virtual wholesaling is a myth. You can't do it. Uh, my question for you is, in your business for the past eight years, what is the largest and smallest virtual wholesaling deal you've ever done? Hmm. It has to be virtual. Yeah. <laughs> Can it be like, did it, it has to be wholesaling? No, yeah. flip, no flips or anything. Okay. I wholesaled a lot for the total fee was like 64,000. I think that's wow. the best one, but that like, I feel like other people, like I still like some people are like I wholesaled something for like a hundred K. I'm like, I've never done a wholesale that big. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm just unique, but I, my flips have been awesome, but oh, I've yeah. never had any like wholesales that really like are storytelling. Um, but I did flip a lot for 64 in Nashville. It was a high end lot. So it was nice. It was like a million dollar home would, was going to go on it. Um, so that was my largest, my smallest. I don't know. Uh, we've probably done one under a thousand, more of a like courtesy, just get it done kind of thing. Wow. Cause like, I mean, we're not going to turn a deal away. If we have a seller, we got a contract and like, yeah, we didn't get the offers we thought we were going to get. Like, we're still going to help the seller, like sell the house. We're not going to be negative on it. So like, we're still going to like do it as a courtesy to the seller. Um, you know, so I cannot tell you my smallest, but I am sure I've, I've got one probably under a thousand, probably. Awesome. I, the reason I ask is I get, everyone comes in, they're 18, 19. They're like virtual wholesalings. It's not real. I mean, people tell me wholesaling is illegal all the time and it, it's fake, but the virtual people get more caught up on it. So that's why I always ask. Uh, my last question for you here is I asked the same question to every single guest. So I started wholesaling four years ago, 300 bucks uh, at the age of 17 and I asked this. So if you were in that situation, you're 18 years old again, you had 300 bucks. What would you do to become the next Lauren Hardy? Ooh, you want to know what I did? Cause I didn't even have $300. <laughs> yeah, <let's know. laughs> okay. I don't, I always say this, like it, it, enter with caution. Um, but I opened up a credit card. <laughs> okay. And I leveraged my business, um, but I just knew I had it in me. Like I knew I was going to make the money back. I just, I just believed in myself. I knew um, I had good mentors. Um, you need to get a mentor. Like you have to, if you can't afford coaching, cause you only have $300, like I get it. Um, you need to somehow get a mentor. Like there's plenty of people out there 
it's hard right now because of COVID, like there's not as many in-person real estate meetings. But I remember when I was new, I went to every real estate meeting in my area and just made friends. And those friends I made, like I'm still friends with some of them, like to this day. And they are people that helped me. Like they taught me. I, I remember I didn't know what a CRM was. Like when I first got, I did not know what a CRM was. And I was at a RIA and this guy, Tim Gordon, he like, he met me there. Like he ran, Hey, I'm Tim. Hi, I'm Lauren. I say, like, and we just got a drink and we're talking. And I was like, yeah, I'm having a hard time, like managing leads. And like, they're like everywhere. Like, I don't even know where to keep them all. Like I try to excel and I don't, he was like, do you have a CRM? And I'm like, what's a CRM? <laughs> so like, those are the things you learn by just talking, like having a lot of conversations. Um, I did everything. Like it was very, it was slow for me because like I had to chip away, you know, at this learning curve, like little by little, like I learned what a CRM was. I learned how to pull lists. Um, originally I got into it agreeing and it was my brother who first got into it and he'd flipped maybe a few homes before me. And he said, Hey, this is kind of working out. Why don't you, you know, try it. And I was like, okay. So I partnered with him with the agreement that he makes 50% of everything we, we do. So I brought him, it was my first two flip properties. I flipped with my brother. He made 60 grand by teaching me what he knew. $60,000 that year, like pretty good return on investment on just exactly. giving me, you know, just giving me some tips and sitting on the phone with me for a couple hours. Like, that's what you're going to have to do. Like, you're going to have to say, listen, I'll give you everything. I'm going to work my butt off and I'll give you 50% of any deal. Just tell me like, what do I need to do first? So I would recommend just butting up, find some kind of mentor that will help you in that way. Okay. And you know what? Tip on mentor. And I want to say this because this is important. Find a mentor that's like just a little at, at first when you're this green, like a little bit further than you. Like if because I get asked all the time, like, hey, will you be my mentor? And I'm like, dude, I, I can't like uh, I am like way like I I have so much going on when you there's a certain level where like you're too busy to mentor anybody. It's not that I'm a mean, it's not that I don't want to help anyone. It's like, literally, I just don't have physically the time to give you. So you need to find somebody that will give like has time to give you. Um, so find somebody that's maybe, you know, like they've done maybe five to 10 deals. And you're like, hey, if you just teach me what you're doing, like, I'll give you 50% of everything until I can spread my wings and fly. And most people, you know, will actually consider that if, you know, they believe in you. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Lauren, thank you so much for coming on. I'm telling you, I looked at my YouTube analytics today and I saw about 20% of everyone watching this is actually a female, which is uh, awesome. Yeah. Um, we need more females out here doing wholesaling and quick secret, especially in my market. I figured out that females are way better closures than males. I've just figured that out and I, it's amazing. So, um, I really appreciate you coming on. You're definitely very inspiring. I think everyone should start looking at your stuff. Um, can you tell us a little about, um, your show that you guys, you have every Wednesday on. Uh, oh, yeah. Deal pros. So, um, and thank you for reminding me by the way that there, you know, that we had it today oh, and yeah. sure there was no conflict. Um, it, and funny enough, I'm not going to be on it tonight. I oh. am moving tomorrow. So tag is doing me a solid and taking it on solo. He could tell I was like stressed. He's like, why don't you just skip deal pros tonight? Like you're moving tomorrow. I have this whole room needs to be packed up. That's why I'm home today because we're packing and we're moving. Um, so yeah, we started, so deal pros, the idea behind it, um, was really just like talking about real stuff, like just like the nitty gritty, like the day to day, what do you say if a seller says this? And like a little bit of storytelling, like it's just an, it's just a, a forum for me and tag to sit and we tell stories. Um, tag actually was one of my mentors. So Wow. Yeah. About, um, several years ago, I saw tag was a little, you know, a little bit ahead of me, right. He was where I wanted to be. Um, you know, I had some success, but I was like, I want to be like him though. And he was virtual and I didn't know a lot. There was no virtual coaching programs at the time. No, none, no virtual coaching programs that I could find except for Kent Clothier. I had one, yeah. I think versus wholesaling. It was only his, I think. Um, so 
oh God, it wasn't his or is it the other? There's this other guy that they kind of remind me of each other. Anyway, I digress. Um, but there, that was so that was the only one I had. It was it was a shorter course. I, I needed a like an actual coach, like a coach where, you know, somebody coach me. So I approached Tab. I said, listen, I will pay you to just sit on the phone with me for an hour, like an hour, maybe every couple of weeks. And those hours just turned to him and me just ch- talking deals. Like it was just, it was like a, a typical coaching. Like, so what do you do if this happens? Hey, by the way, can you look at these homes and make sure I comp them out? Right. Like I would just borrow his time for an hour and he would answer my questions. And so what that turned into is it turned into a friendship, <laughs> you know, like it turned into, I don't need him anymore. So I don't need to pay him, but it turned into a friendship. He's one of my dear friends in the business. We still bounce everything off to each other. Um, so we came up with like, why don't we just like do this live? Like, let's just like have these conversations live and people can ask us like, Hey, can you cop a house out? Or Hey, like, just like the real questions, you know, like that come up. Um, not so much of like show status. Sometimes we bring in a guest and we'll do it like a show. Um, but for the most part, it's actually just like a, let's just have a dialogue. Anybody have questions, anybody want to talk about stuff? Um, so it really stuck. Um, but we are working on something together that we're not talking about yet. So it does kind of, we'll eventually start talking about it. Um, but there is definitely a, there's something coming very, very soon. We're really excited about, so we'll have to, you know, kind of go into it a little bit later. I love it. Shout out to tag. He always comments on our, uh, face, my Facebook stuff. So wanted to include him on there. Um, help him out, but uh, great guy. So um, I really appreciate you coming on uh, again. I think also the way that you run your business, you're able to spend time with your kids is the opposite of the corporate life. Um, so it's definitely very inspiring. So uh, before we hop off here, is there anything else you want to share with the audience before we uh, hop off? Gosh, you know, what's so funny. Um, Steve train ta- like tagged me in something that I was saying on his show. And I literally thought I was like, if I died today, I would want this to be like my last words in my in the professional space, like in my to anybody who ever followed or listened to me. I want you guys to go on Steve Trang's Instagram and look at this the latest post on his feed. And it's me going into how I was not an overnight success. I was a total turtle. I would, and I felt inferior a lot when I first got started. Um, I think that there is a lot of people in this business that sort of overshare and they, um, they fluff their businesses up. They talk about themselves in, you know, in multipliers of 10, (laughs) you know? Um, And so I, and it always, I remember like, it made me feel like kind of inferior. Like, why am I like not doing $100,000 $100,000 a month. <laughs> like what? Like that's crazy because this guy's 25 and he's doing $100,000 a month. Why am I not doing 100 you know? And then you're like, "Oh, because that guy's lying." <laughs> or or you know, that guy it's like you know, there's so many different scenarios and situations of why like that that guy's doing 100. So stay in your lane, focus on yourself. Um don't I know it's, it's so easy to kind of compare yourself and then feel inferior, but also like be really freaking proud of yourself. If you guys are watching this right now, you are like taking the time out of your day instead of like coming home and having a beer and like watching Netflix, like you're sitting here educating yourself on something to better yourself. And that is already better than probably 80% of the population right now. So feel good about your actions, your daily actions. Maybe you're not making the money right now. So you feel like, oh man, maybe this is for nothing, but it really isn't. It's a, it's a compound effect. Like everything that I did, I didn't make a lot of money at first. Like, and it was very slow, slow, slow. And then it compounded really, really fast. So I do believe in the compound effect. That's a Darren Hardy book. If you guys want to read and kind of understand the idea behind it, Um, keep grinding, keep educating yourself, kind of stay in your lane and don't um, try not to like compare yourself to me right now on this show. You know, I'm not any better than you guys. Like don't compare yourself to me. I mean, if anything, if you probably did, you probably would like feel good because I'm a hot mess. So, um, so yeah, that's what I want to leave you guys off with. Wow. Thank you so much, Lauren. I really appreciate it, guys. I guess I'll see you uh, next week on the next podcast. Thank you guys so much for the support. Have a good one.